uh, I'll be very brief because Professor Littleton is known to all of you. He's not just uh, the best known Anglophone historian of Italy, but he's also, I think, the best known student of fascism in and out of Italy. And you know perhaps that his book entitled The Seizure of Power, Fascism in Italy, 1919 to 1929, is now in its fourth edition. And you also know perhaps uh, a recent review essay that he wrote in the New York Review of Books on unification on Cavour, as I recall, and on the liberal tradition in Italy, which gave a much more humane, more favorable, and I think more accurate interpretation of this liberal statesman and of his thought and action than the view which prevailed when I did a field in Italian history as a graduate student in the early 1960s. And this is a memory of that. It is a bu bust of Garibaldi. And I had an Italian friend who came to my office and he said, oh, it's wonderful, Italian kitsch. <laughs> 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 so um, it's also significant that one of his current interests, I've been told, is in the work of Sismondi Sismondi, who was a humane liberal of the first decades of the 19th century, and as such, uh, managed inevitably to find among his critics, not just liberal thinkers, uh, favorable to Say and Ricardo's views, but on the other shore to Karmark himself. So his next talk on Monday, I think we'll consider the Southern problem. And his talk today will deal with currents of historiographic interpretations in Italian history. So again, Adrian, it is a pleasure and an honor for us to see you here today. Thank you very much, Patrice. Uh, get up here, you can't even see the, all the audience from down there. Um, well, thanks uh, very much. I did, um, I did talk a little bit in the first week about the more kitsch aspects of um, the celebrations of Italian unification. Just so as to sort of keeping up with Patrice, I may say that I was, it's like a sort of lion's session, I was proud to receive for one of my birthdays a gift instead of a bust of Victor Emmanuel from Dennis Mac Smith, the Dwayne of all English um, Italian historians. And I'm a good enough friend of Dennis not to suspect, in view of his, his and indeed mine, on the whole antipathy to Victor Emmanuel, that this was a, a, a backhanded compliment. No, I think it was uh, a, a very well-meant gift. Um, well, I will try and not run over my time, but I can see that today this is going to be quite difficult. So anyway. Uh, cough heavily when thing, if things get too tough. Um, my talk today uh, is called The Passions and the Interests. And this title is, of course, taken from the fine book by Albert Hirschman. And I must say the title is sort of intended more as a kind of signpost or suggestion of how we might try to look at the Risorgimento than as a strictly descriptive summary. In other words, I'll stray a bit from my script as defined by the title. Hirschman's book, of course, described how in the 18th century the interests, the interests, quote, and the advance of commercial society were seen as a moderating influence on the destructive passions identified by earlier moralists. His study did not extend to the next stage, associated with Rousseau and the origins of Romanticism, when the passions came to be seen instead as a necessary corrective to the egotism of commercial society. Uh, and, on the continent at least, for its willingness to accept despotism in return for a quiet life. National pride and even national hatreds were seen as positive alternatives to an effeminate, luxury-loving cosmopolitanism. In Italy, the tragic poet Vittorio Alfieri, with his cult of the will and his admiration for the sublime crimes dictated by passion, which showed that Italian virtue in its Machiavellian sense, was not dead, was the originator of this revolt. In a different way, uh, he incidentally blamed his, uh, linked the whole thing to his aversion for his French dancing master. In a different way, Mazzini, who insisted that faith rather than reason was the first necessity for a national movement, embodied the rejection of a politics founded on interest. A strong note of caution is needed here, however. Mazzini was an admirer of Condorcet and a firm believer in the perfecti perfectibility of man 
through the progress of civilization. So it would in general be wrong to see the Italian romantics as rejecting the heritage of the Enlightenment, although they were critical of the excesses of the cult of reason during the French Revolution. But it was, of course, also possible to see the French Revolution as a triumph of the destructive passions, including that for virtue, and to react by advocating a cooler, more moderate politics based on the recognition of interests, and above all, on the new science of political economy. 18th century Italy, <coughs> particularly in Naples and Milan, had made important contributions to the new science. And Pietro Custodi's multi-volume publication of Italian economists under, under the reign of Napoleon was a monument to Italian achievement. Writers like Custodi and Melchiorre Gioia turned to political economy and statistics as a rational alternative to the failed politics of Italian Jacobinism, a term which has a much looser significance uh, than it has in France, signifying usually any supporter of French revolutionary doctrines. I don't want again to set up these categories as exclusive. A politics based on interest and political economy did not exclude national passions, or the reverse. Yet I think one can regard them as polar opposites between which individuals moved, or as ideal types, the Weberian sense. To take a prime example, it would be difficult to deny that Mazzini embodied primarily a politics of passion and the evo evocation of emotion, while Cavour, though he should not be denied his sheer passion for Italian nationality and liberty, embodied primarily a policy of the rational calculation of interests and was convinced that political economy had laid down the guidelines for progress. I hope the rationale of my title will emerge more clearly at the end of my discussion. Um, by way of a preface, before considering some of the problems of interpreting the Risorgimento, some of the interpretations which have, be, which have been advanced, I would like to talk briefly about the national drama which was played out between 1859 and 1861, and which, of course, Italians have been celebrating this year. In the 19th and early 20th centuries, the creation of the Kingdom of Italy uh, was often, even if in 1861 it still lacked uh, Rome and the Veneto, was often described as a miracle. And in a way, I think we should take this uh, description seriously if with a pinch of salt. There was something almost miraculous about the manner in which it came about. The 17th of March, 1861, the official uh, anniversary date in which Parliament declared Victor Emmanuel II, King of Italy, by the grace of God and the will of the nation, does not, of course, provide an arresting image. So if you want to identify a founding moment of United Italy with high symbolic significance, uh, we should choose, I think, uh, the meeting of Garibaldi and Victor Emmanuel on the 23rd of October at Teano, a small town, a small town in northern Campania, near the border between Campania, between the Kingdom of Naples and the Papal States, former Papal States, where Garibaldi, in a magnificent gesture, presented the king with Naples and Sicily. This is not like most uh, historical pictures, a very accurate uh, depiction. We know that actually Garibaldi took his hat off and waved it and, and, and shouted, long live Victor Emmanuel, king of Italy. Uh, this handshake is supposed to express more strongly uh, the notion of union and also perhaps to play down slightly the, the inconvenient fact that sort of Garibaldi was actually presenting Victor Emmanuel with a kingdom nearly all of which he, Garibaldi, and not the king, had conquered. Now let me see if we can, if I can um, rapidly, the answer is no, if I can rapidly bring up the next slide, next picture, sorry. Um, no. no, I'm not doing well. Sorry, should get better. Yeah, here we have a very rapidly the, the full, slightly smaller version of the thing. I just wanted to show this because it shows more clearly the followers of the two sides. Uh, the red shirts of Garibaldi on the left with their rather irregular clothing and the regular troops following Victor Emmanuel um, on the right. Um, now, uh, Garibaldi's thousand volunteers had survived by an amazing combat combination of courage, skill, and luck. 
and had triggered the collapse first of Bourbon rule, rule in Sicily and then in Naples. In 1859, even, the unification of Lombardy uh, with Piedmont, followed by that of Tuscany in what is now Emilia-Romagna, was a triumph for the diplomatic and political skills of Cavour, which was almost equally remarkable, if less heroic. The problem about political miracles, however, is that because they are improbable, they are hard to sustain and to live up to. Cavour, as late as 1856, had talked of those who believed in Italian unity and other such nonsense. He did not believe in it, that is to say, as a practical possibility in the immediate future and was quite unprepared for the annexation of Naples. Now, don't misunderstand me. If the actual circumstances of Italy's unification in 1859-60 to 60 were improbable and even astonishing, in a longer time span, I think Italian unification had a logic and a high degree of probability. This was, after all, an age in which the nation-state was coming more and more to be seen as the highest form of political organization. Austria, the main obstacle to ind in Italian independence, was overstretched, facing Prussian competition in Germany as well as French in Italy, and the other states of Italy were weak. It's unlikely that Naples would have survived very long as an independent kingdom once the rest of Italy had been unified. Since 1848, when there had been real mass participation in the independence movement, and when all the old regimes had collapsed, even if they were later restored, the likelihood of Italy eventually becoming independent was, I think, high. Still, Italy actually preceded Germany on the road to national independence. Uh, when uh, German nationalists in the 1860s talked about realpolitik, the statesman they referred to was not yet Bismarck, of course, but actually often Cavour. And the Risorgimento was admired in Europe and as far away as India or even China as the paradigm for movements of national liberation. It was an event, therefore, of far more than local significance, something that historians have not always emphasized sufficiently. What was the downside, however, of the miracle? Uh, first, the Teano meeting offers a clue to how precarious the union of forces which brought about unity actually was. It involved the miraculous reconciliation of a popular revolutionary guerrilla leader and a king of ancient lineage, the first of his line to live his entire reign as a constitutional monarch. Dynastic traditionalism was strong enough, indeed, to prevent Victor Emmanuel from becoming Victor Emmanuel I of Italy. He remained Victor Emmanuel II, his title as King of Sardinia. Imagine if James the, uh, the, uh, the first had continued to call himself of England had continued to call himself James the sixth. Now, still more difficult and superficial. That's why this slide, uh, this uh, sorry, uh, picture is particularly appropriate. Um, uh, still more difficult and superficial was the reconciliation between the forces they represented: Garibaldi's volunteers and the regular army. Uh, Garibaldi and the volunteers uh, practiced a different kind of warfare, one in which the distinction between uh, civilians and soldiers were blur was blurred, uh, like this, uh, like some of the pictures. But you can see this even more clearly if you see one of the finest portraits of Garibaldi, slightly before surveying the battlefield, uh, very informally dressed, not in sort of traditional. There are more traditional military figures in the background, but the sort of figure of the citizen soldier, and he's actually holding a cigar, cigars and pipes, a sort of emblems of kind of almost bohemian uh, informality, which are common among uh, volunteers. And if we see this earlier uh, picture by the same painter, actually, let's try and blow this up in decent size. Um, no. Sorry. Yeah, that's not going very well, but I'll try and um, get more of that in the picture. This is, again, you see the pipe there. This is a picture of a, of, uh, a volunteer of Garibaldi's rather earlier uh, during the siege of Rome. And you can see the same image which contrasts very strongly with the, the traditional type of military image. And Garibaldi, of course, wanted to create a new type of army. This was a very serious political objective of his in 1860, the nation in arms, 
which would be inspired by patriotism, not just by loyalty to the monarchy. The regular army officers were, of course, extremely jealous uh, of Garibaldi's success and grudging towards the claims of the volunteers to be incorporated in the regular army. Garibaldi, though his moderation, realism, and the priority he put on independence had all prevented conflict, was a product of the republican and revolutionary wing of the Italian movement. Victor Emmanuel was backed by the forces of order, many of whom had been skeptical about the introduction of civil liberties and constitutional government. The myth of some kind of harmonious convergence or synthesis of the leading figures of the Risorgimento to achieve unity has long been exploited. Even if one divides the four historic leaders into two pairs of natural allies, Garibaldi and Mazzini on the left, uh, and Victor Emmanuel and Cavour on the right, relations between the allies were not easy. Victor Emmanuel disliked Cavour quite intensely and resented his successful efforts to expand the powers of Parliament, and therefore his own, over those of the monarchy. One of the reasons why Cavour was not at Teano was that he did not stand the company of the king for very long. I asked to Victor Emmanuel only one favour, to be allowed to remain as far away from him as possible. But more than personal antipathy was involved, there were serious issues at stake. Was the monarchy going to give primacy to its dynastic Piedmontese traditions or to its new Italian responsibilities? Was the king to choose his ministers independently from Parliament, as the formal statuto granted in 1848 allowed him to do, and as the Kaiser did in Germany? Or was he to respect the convention that they must command a parliamentary majority? <coughs> Although we can see, after 1860, a trend away from the dynastic towards the national and from the royal to the parliamentary prerogative in choosing ministers, these were not issues which ever went away or were quite satisfactorily settled. Again, the monarchy was supposed to act as the unifying symbol for the new nation. As the former Republican, Francesco Crispi, Garibaldi's lieutenant in Sicily, famously said, the monarchy unites us, the republic would divide us. And there was a kind of double image of the king as father and as hero. But could the monarchy be trusted to act as a neutral, arbitrating force in politics? And did, on the other hand, the kings of Italy have confidence in the loyalty of their new subjects? The answer to both these questions remained uncertain. And I think it was a crucial weakness that while the Royal House of Italy remained in its traditions and education a military monarchy, it was very short on military prestige. True, the Piedmontese army had performed well enough in 1859, uh, though the bulk of the fighting and the casualties had been sustained by the much larger and more efficient French army. But when the new Italian army took the field in 1866, it suffered a humiliating, if not decisive, defeat at Custozza. Even the navy was defeated by the Austrians at Lissa, with the fleet which was actually largely manned by sailors who spoke Italian, from Trieste and elsewhere. The volunteers under Garibaldi had a far better record of military success, although their defeat at Mentana in 1867 by the French troops who were defending the Pope dented the myth of their invisibility. Well, I've tried to point one of the issues which divided Italians still, that of the monarchical and republican traditions, miraculously reconciled in, in 1860, but nevertheless leaving their mark on subsequent history. Let me now turn to discuss uh, fairly summarily some interpretations of the Risorgimento, trying to get particularly as fast as I can towards the uh, more contemporary interpretations. I will distinguish five main families of interpretation, the liberal, the republican democratic, the nationalist, the Marxist and social, or socio-economic, and the cultural. Each of them, I think, was some way dominant or hegemonic in one period of post-unification history, but they are, of course, all by no means limited to a single period. I have not considered Catholic interpretations, which certainly is an omission, although I think that, uh, curiously, they have never really dominated the intellectual sphere. First, the Risorgimento liberal interpretation. The making of the nation is seen as bound up with the achievement of free institutions in the general European context of the parallel national struggles for liberty and self-determination. 
And this interpretation, I would say, remains dominant roughly in the first 50 years after unity. Well, the end of this time being challenged, I think, by a more strictly nationalist interpretation. The liberal orthodoxy that develops during this period, I would say mainly beneath the actual level of the professional historians, uh, also sees the achievement of unity in 1859-60 to 60 as a providential synthesis between rival men and programs. And the significance of political conflicts within the national field is played down or treated as a, some kind of positive dialect dialectic leading to synthesis. I should add that the official cult of the Risorgimento, particularly as conveyed by the education system and by the numerous museums of the Risorgimento, emphasized the role of the monarchy in achieving this synthesis. History was a tool of a nationalizing pedagogy, which emphasized both the glorious years of our Risorgimento and the human face of the kings of Savoy, whose family affections and daily life make them like ourselves. Not all the supporters of the monarchy were, by the way, pleased by this homely image. They wanted sometimes something grander, more military and more traditional. The rise of fascism made the liberal interpretation more problematic and pessimistic. For example, Benedetto Croce's History of the Kingdom of Naples, the earliest of his three great historical works, sees unification as the fulfillment of the ideals of the virtuous minority of Neapolitan society, even after their brutal suppression in the revolution and reaction of 1799. And this is contrasted with a critical and pessimistic interpretation of the deficiencies of the kingdom's political and social constitution. Now, more also in the next uh, talk. The most distinguished representative of post-1945 liberal historiography, Rosario Romeo, in his History of the Risorgimento in Sicily, makes a similar evaluation to Croce's on Naples. Although unlike him, he put social and economic developments at the center of his analysis. He wrote, the Risorgimento of Sicily has no real history of its own. The study of the process of political and cultural modernization is used by Romeo to explain, quote, how the movement for autonomy traditional to the island was overcome and surpassed. So a very Hegelian language, I would say. Although Croce certainly did not ignore the importance of social movements, his historical me method was strongly criticized after 1945 for concentrating too heavily on the elites of politics and culture. These interpretations, I think you can see, are strongly teleological. That is to say, they interpret earlier events and aspirations with an eye to the final result of national unity, assumed as historically just and inevitable. One result of this, in my view, has been to misunderstand the importance and dynamics of 1848, which is, of course, a shorthand for the movements of revolution and reaction that actually extended from 1846 to 1849. They underestimate and, I think, misunderstand its importance by evaluating, by evaluating it solely in terms of its contribution to the final solutions of 1859 to 61. The second family or school, uh, briefly referred to, is the nationalist interpretation of the Risorgimento, dominant evidently under fascism. I would call it nationalist rather than fascist in a strict sense because it is usually strongly monarchist and primarily engaged in the study of international diplomacy and power politics, the thesis of the primacy of foreign policy, in fact. The leading historian of this school, Gioacchino Volpe, described foreign policy as, quote, the prime manifestation of national life, the specific activity through which a people comes to feel itself to be a nation. The history of the Savoy monarchy's dynastic expansion is often presented, again in teleological terms, as a process which naturally led up to its role in unifying Italy. It's dated back to at least the beginning of the 18th century, very often to the 16th century or beyond. I should say also that the leading figures of nationalist fascist culture, both Volpe and the philosopher Giovanni Gentile, criticized the liberal state for its failure to include the masses. Garibaldi and Mazzini, without their permission, I would say, were both co-opted as precursors of fascism, for instance, in Gentile's Prophets of the Risorgimento. Cavour, although sometimes praised for his real politique, was, as a liberal, relatively neglected. 
After 1946, it was clear that in the new republic in Italy, if the liberal tradition of interpretation was not to be abandoned altogether, it needed substantial revision. It was above all the collusion of the monarchy with fascism that made this inevitable. The fascist appropriation of the Risorgimento had already in the 1930s posed a problem for its democratic opponents. Some believed that they could cut their ties with the Risorgimento altogether. Carlo Rosselli, the founder of the important movement Giustizia e Libertà and of Socialismo Liberale as a doctrine, liberal socialism, uh, stated this, uh, the problem, I think, with particular clarity. He asked whether the anti-fascist movement should link itself to the Risorgimento or whether it should make a tabula rasa of it, leaving the monopoly to fascism. He answered that while the second alternative would be wrong and unwise, we must be pitiless with the official and scholastic myth of the Risorgimento. The Philistine Italy of the House of Savoy has been a failure. These anti-fascist interpretations, which in particular criticize the role of the monarchy, can actually be linked to much earlier interpretations of Italian history by historians of republican and democratic tendencies, such as Carlo Tivaroni, the author of an important critical history of Italy, published towards the end of the 19th century. And they look back to Mazzini, alternatively to the federalist Carlo Cattaneo, whose writings enjoyed an intellectual vogue uh, in the post-war period. Another important intellectual influence was that of the anti-fascist journalist Piero Dobetti, who died as a result of a beating he received at the hands of a fascist squad, who was the author, among other uh, important works, of Risorgimento Senza Eroi, Risorgimento Without Heroes. And Robetti and Rosselli were the intellectual fathers of the short-lived Partito d'Azione, which, of course, name, uh, copied the name of Mazzini's political party. Though it failed politically, Azionismo remained a powerful intellectual force. It has been much praised and much denounced, both as a virtuous minority out of touch with the realities of mass politics and for its attempt to build bridges between liberalism and socialism. However, of course, uh, the strongest challenge to the Trotschian and liberal interpretation came from a Marxist socio-economic interpretation. Although actually, Italian Marxism from Gramsci onwards showed strong signs of Trotschian influence, being often preoccupied with ideas and ideologies rather than social and economic structures. In fact, when I uh, worked in the Gramsci Institute in Rome, I was rather unimpressed by their holdings in economic history, whereas they were very good uh, in other forms of history. The interest in social and economic history, on the other hand, was not confined to Marxists. I, I would say I'm also there were some Marxists who made a very serious business of studying, like Giuliano Procacci, studying social structures. Uh, there was a general perception of mass participation in the Risorgimento, or more precisely its absence, its assumed absence, as the central problem, which was vital to the understanding of the deficiencies of the new nation state and the eventual collapse of the liberal state into fascism. There emerged a dominant interpretation which in some ways bridged the gap between the liberal and social or Marxist schools. It involved a return to the idea of the Risorgimento as part of the general process of the modernization of European societies beginning in the 18th century Enlightenment. However, in polemic with the nationalist school, the new interpretation insisted that what was important was it not Italy's sole contribution, but Italy's participation in the general uh, European movement of enlightenment and reform. The encyclopedic masterwork of this school is Franco Venturi's great multi-volume uh, work on the Europe of the reforms. Undoubtedly, there were great advantages in the new studies of social, economic, and intellectual history. I think the only problem, however, which emerged is that the specific object of the nation, that strange object of desire, tended to disappear from the story. It would be unjust to say this was true in Franco Venturi's case, although the theme of the nation is relatively marginal, I would say, in his oeuvre. The social interpretation of Risorgimento can obviously be explained by the revulsion against the nationalist and fascist interpretations, and it was also in line from the 1960s with, I would say, general trends in European history writing. There was also a rather vulgarized version of this, which saw history as a sort of progressive escalator, in which unity was a necessarily positive stage in modernization, though with many defects. Gramsci was the heir of the Enlightenment, the Togliatti of Gramsci, and so on. 
again, a strongly teleological viewpoint. Mazzini, for example, in this view, represents a step forward, but he is obviously destined to be simply superseded by Marx. Um, finally, I get to the cultural interpretation, which is the most interesting new interpretation of the Risorgimento, I think. And these interesting new interpretation or interpretations seem at first sight to have their origins not so much in political changes as in a perception among professional historians that Italy was being left behind by a new wave of studies of the nation and nationalism, many of which had their origins in the social sciences and anthropology with Ernest Gellner and Benedict Anderson or in literary studies. Italian contemporary history writing had been left behind by the linguistic turn. Of course, the insistence that to understand a period you have to master its vocabulary was hardly new. What was new, however, was a more systematic approach to the study of texts inspired by structuralist or post-structuralist literary theory and by anthropology, and the extension of these methods to the interpretation of practices and even events. However, I think it's clear that the political as opposed to the professional context has had a very important influence the collapse of the so-called First Republic at the end of the dominance of the party system, which, by the way, had been a major source of patronage and promotion uh, for historians, uh, and the new worries about the fate of the nation in the face both of pressures from the European Union and, uh, more directly, the challenge, which I talked about last time, the challenge from the Northern League. Um, still, the period remained out of fashion, really, I would say. The period of Sorgimento, surprisingly, remained... Most studies of the nation actually dealt with post-1860 nation. Risorgimento still remained really out of fashion till about 2000. And the last appro new approach has only really broken through in the last decade. Uh, the most well-known and certainly most convincing example of the new history uh, that views the nation as a cultural construction is Alberto Banti's La Nazione del Risorgimento, The Nation of the Risorgimento. His method is rigorous and, inter and interesting although I think it does raise some problems. He examines a sample of memoirs of the protagonists of the Risorgimento and asks, what were the sources of their commitment to the cause of the nation? What was the source of their conviction that the Italian nation existed or could exist? He finds the answer not in strictly political writings, but in a series of literary texts. These are to be found above all in poems, tragedies, historical novels, opera librettos, memoirs, and histories. Only two political essays by Cesare Barbo and Gioberti are cited, along with a generic reference to the writings of Mazzini. The contribution of both the visual arts and music to the diffusion of particular national themes and images, Banti also, I think, quite rightly, regards as extremely important. Banti argues that together these sources make up what he calls the Risorgimento canon, which he proceeds to analyse. It is marked by the evocation of particular historical events and the use of particular languages which invested the nation with a high emotional significance. One of the most interesting and I think valid conclusions that Banti reaches is that the propaganda for the nation was most effective when it succeeded in drawing on older pre-national attachments and modes of feeling and expression. He is critical, particularly of Eric Hobsbawm, but also even of Benedict Anderson for not emphasizing this enough. He analyzes two of these languages in particular, the language that speaks of the nation as a community of blood and kinship, and the language that speaks of the nation in religious terms as a community of sacrifice, devotion, and martyrdom. The Risorgimento itself is a rebirth, of course, which literally means, and is easily translated into religious terms as a resurrection. And, in fact, I think see no problem with the argument that uh, the Risorgimento, particularly in the writings of Mazzini, founded a political religion. Banti rejects, moreover, the distinction that Federico Chabot made in his well-known book on the idea of the nation, Idea della Nazione, shortly after the war, between the pure voluntarist and political concept of the nation in the Italian Risorgimento and the dangerous determinist cultural and ethnic conceptions of those guys over the Alps of German nationalism. Banti argues that Italian nationalism, even in its freedom-loving phase, was far from free of the rhetoric of blood and soil. 
embodying a particular emotive appeal to defend the sacred soil of the patria and the honor of pure Italian women from the designs of foreigners and their treacherous Italian allies. Well, I think there is much value in Banti's correction of the overemphasis in Italian historiography on intellectual justifications for national commitment. What he has written could well be called a history of the national passion. That's a sort of clue to my title. But I also have some reservations. First of all, given that the recipients of the message whom Banti identifies nearly all came from the ed educated classes, uh, aren't directly political texts somewhat underrepresented? It must be remembered that these last were often linked to a specific political context and therefore were less likely to be cited when that context changed. They often circulated with difficulty because of censorship, but we know that the cumulative diffusion of illegal pamphlets and journals, what we can call the Italian samizdat, had a great impact. On the eve of 1848, for example, this phenomenon convinced a number of defenders of the old monarchies that granting a measure of press freedom would actually be less harmful than leaving the field of political news and comment to be monopolized by clandestine publications. Although these publications were by their nature often ephemeral, some, like Luigi Settembrini's protests of the people of the two Sicilies, achieved great fame. Uh, one might still argue that this political literature only appealed to the converted, and that the conversion experience was an emotional one linked to the type of reading of imaginative and historical literature that Banti describes. I think, indeed, that there is a lot of truth in that, but there is also some risk of oversimplification. For example, Banti, Banti attributes Mazzini's conversion, which certainly had a sort of quasi-religious character, to the impression made on him by the spectacle of patriots forced into exile by the failure of the 1821 Piedmontese Revolution, and also to the reading, one of the books of the canon, Fostola's famous novel, The Confessions of Jacopo Ortis. Um, but in Mazzini's autobiography, he actually says that the work by Foscolo, though it affected him powerfully, plunged him into depression, which is not altogether surprising since the novel ends with the hero's suicide. It took the reading of other, more rational texts for him to overcome this depression. I think in general, that at least uh, in the passage to political action, the emotional charge, after all, had to receive some direction and orientation. One perhaps reached somewhat different conclusions by a study of the language of politics in 1848, in 1847 to 8, or in 1859 to 60, as expressed in the numerous representative assemblies and also in political clubs. In the Sicilian assemblies of 1848, for example, we find a surprising degree of unanimity in support of the principle of popular sovereignty, although it is often divorced from any serious consideration of the cultural and economic constraints on its exercise. While I have no reservations in regard to Banti's analysis of the sacralization of the nation through the use of religious language and symbolism, I do have some doubts about his analysis of the other main field of discourse he identifies, that of blood and kinship. Is, are the frequency of invocations of the defense of female purity and Italian blood enough to justify the argument the Italian community was conceived as an ethnic community, a sort of extended family, linked essentially by blood ties. I think myself that this is perhaps to give a more definite, uh, concrete, political and ideological significance to this emotive language than it in fact possessed. The metaphor of brotherhood, fratellanza, is certainly a key one in the Risorgimento, and particularly so for Mazzini, both during 1847-8 to and after 1860. The associations of artisans that he promoted from the 1840s onwards, starting with Italian workers in London, uh, were called fratellanze artigiane, and in the first year, 20 years of Italian unity, they became perhaps the most important vehicle for the spread of Republican ideas. And of course, the national hymn, which you all heard very often this year, written by the young Genoese poet, Goffredo Mameli, is called Fratelli d'Italia. Certainly this is a metaphor of kinship, but I don't think it can be taken quite literally. Banti himself also refers to the importance of the pact which creates the union of patriots. Verdi's most explicitly patriotic opera, La Battaglia di Legnano, with a libretto by Salvatore Camarano, which had its first performance in Rome in January 1849, shortly before the proclamation of the Roman Republic, 
and which aroused enormous enthusiasm, starts with the chorus, Viva, I'm sorry, I can't sing it, I can't sing. It starts with the chorus, Viva Italia, un sacro patto, tutti stringe i figli suoi, esso al fin di tanti ha fatto, un sol popolo di eroi. Long live Italy, a sacred pact, that's what I emphasize, uh, uh, unites all its children. But this pact is clearly a voluntary act that creates a fictive kinship between blood brothers, where it is, I think, the willingness to shed your blood for your comrades that bears the weight. Against too ethnic an interpretation of risorgimento, I would like to emphasize that foreigners, providing they were on the right side, were welcomed with open arms uh, into the national movement. It's true that Banti, in his latest book, Sublime Madre Nostra, uh, does show some interesting exceptions to this rule in the hatred and suspicion during 1848-9 towards anyone with a German-sounding name or someone who had a German or even other foreign spouse. But this was, after all, in time of war, and I don't think that we can take this as a cultural norm for other times. If one can make a comparison, in England during 1914-1918, anti-German hysteria led to the repudiation of German names and German culture on a wide scale. But I don't think that this can be taken as evidence for attitude to Germans either before or even after the war. Uh, nor were minorities in Italy excluded. Indeed, they played a role in the Risorgimento out of proportion to their numbers. Southerners of Albanian descent and Orthodox religion played a notable role in the revolutions of 1848 and 1860, to start with Garibaldi's later lieutenant and prime minister of Italy, Francesco Crispi, and I would mention also a lesser-known figure, Calabrian Democrat Domenico Mauro. A test case for the conception of the nation is, I think, evidently the attitude towards the Jewish minority. Now here, the evidence quite clearly shows that liberal and democratic patriots made a deliberate and on the whole successful effort to overcome popular prejudices and to include the emancipated Jews as fully qualified members of the new nation. In 1847 to 8, uh, this um, determination was expressed through solemn rituals that affirmed the national brotherhood of Jews and Christians. These took place in Livorno, Rome, and other centers where there was a large Jewish community. It is particularly impressive that the same popular quarters of Rome, particularly Trastevere, the famous court of Trastevere, which at the time of the first French-dominated Roman Republic of 1798 had actually rioted violently against the release of the Jews from the ghetto and had attempted to carry out a full-scale pogrom, were now persuaded by democratic propagandists with the famous popular leader Angel Angelo Brunetti, known as Ciceruacchio, at their head, to accept the Jews' emancipation from legal restrictions and to hold banquets of reconciliation. One might note that these ceremonies occurred before the break between the liberal movement and the church. Later on, the hostility of the official Catholic Church of the papacy, the papacy to the new nation, was certainly a motive that strengthened the mutual sympathy of liberal patriots and members of the Jewish community. It accounts for the remarkable uh, absence, relative absence of anti-Semitism from Italian national ideology, that is to say in the pre-fascist period. So I would argue that Banti has somewhat exaggerated the significance of blood brotherhood and of the community of dissent. I have another more limited problem uh, with Banti's argument. The memoirs from which he draws his evidence, which after all are also texts and that have to be interpreted, and which often have a very precise political intention, date mostly from after 1860. I would argue that this leads him to underestimate the influence of ideas which were not compatible with the orthodoxies of that period, for example, federalism. I'll skip uh, quite a bit here. Uh, let me uh, come on, however, to the question of interests, to why we need uh, to bring interests back in. Uh, for many participants in the Risorgimento, it was not enough that Italy become a united nation. It had to become a modern nation, capable of once again taking its place beside Britain, uh, France and other leaders of Europe, and to achieve this it had to attain freedom of expression, freedom of religion, and the defense of legal rights against arbitrary government action. The Risorgimento was not a movement dictated, it's difficult to prove that, by one block of powerful interests, particularly not by a powerful bourgeoisie, but that does not mean that it did not have eminently practical aims. 
I'll quote from Emilio Gentile's latest book, Italiani Senza Padri, Italians Without Fathers. And it's worth remembering that uh, Gentile previously wrote a book called La Grande Italia, in fact, on the history of the ideology of the great Italy. Quote, the Risorgimento is not only rhetoric about Roman greatness and the abstract ideals of rebirth, but a reflection on the economy, on development, on progress, on industry, on railways. Cavour and Catania are not thinkers inflamed by the ideal of a great Italy, but are concerned with the problems of a modern society and economy, observing what is happening in England, in Belgium, and in France. <coughs> Railways would further the unification of Italy, moral unification of Italy, Cavour said that, but they would also increase the possibilities of marketing and exporting agricultural goods. And it is no accident that the core group of Italian liberals contains so many improving landlords with an interest in commercializing agriculture. Piedmontese Cavour, the Tuscan Ricasoli, and the Bolognese Minghetti, the most prominent examples. Well, writers and intellectuals themselves not perhaps have all only ideal mo uh, motivations. They had a direct interest in freeing the new literary market from the distortions of censorship, in establishing a national copyright, in diffusing the national language, and in contesting the dominance of the church in the teaching profession. The ideal of an open Italy with a merchant marine protected by its own flag and committed to free trade and the removal of internal customs barriers appealed to many of the commercial middle classes, much less often to industrialists who wanted to retain the barriers, actually, and helps to explain why port cities like Genoa and Livorno were centers of Italian patriotism. Even the fashioning of the nation as a cultural construct was not all passion, blood, and soil. It involved the organization of a national time and a national space. Counting inhabitants and resources was conceived as a vital national task, as Silvana Patriarca showed in her excellent study of statistics, a word, of course, with a wider meaning then than now. Cesare Correnti, a Milanese intellectual and politician who was much involved in this movement for national statistics, was also a key figure in developing a national geography which delimited and divided national territory. <coughs> Finally, sociability and the development of civil society and public space, and the problem, of course, not wholly resolved, of making them national rather than purely local, is also a theme which carries over from the Enlightenment and the idea of a society civilized by the commerce of ideas as well as of goods. One of the magic phrases of the Risorgimento was the, quote, the spirit of association, which could be invoked to light by the founders of joint stock companies, by the liberal nobility and bourgeois in their clubs and reading circles, and by Mazzini, uh, no, uh, no least. For Mazzini, indeed, the idea of association was sacred and formed part of a triad with humanity and progress which would ideally replace the old triad of equality, liberty, and fraternity. Though, you see, he did use language of fraternity. I would say that brotherhood and association were, for Mazzini, roughly equivalent. In this year of national celebration, I would like to draw attention, in fact, to the neglected anniversary of 1848, which attracted relatively little interest in Italy. Historian Simonetta Soldani wrote in her essay from, quote, from divided memory to silence, that the anniversary had showed that 1848 can no longer arouse collective attention. The old stereotypes were dead and nothing had replaced them. It was the flight from the roots of our own recent history that is rapidly swallowing 1848 in the quicksand of indifference and threatens to estrange us from ourselves. More specifically, the neglect of 1848 threatens to obscure the indigenous roots of Italian democracy, and on the other hand, the European significance of Risorgimento, so as the great year of national revolutions, of revolutions, and also the existence, I think, of widespread mass participation in the national movement. Um, I believe that the community, sorry, I believe that the commonly accepted definition of the Risorgimento as the work of elites or virtuous minorities is inaccurate and in the past was self-serving. Catania pointed out that the vast majority of the casualties in the Milan rising against the Austrians in 1848, the Cinque Giornate di Milano, came from the popular classes and not from the bourgeoisie or even students. And one could cite many other examples. That elite leadership was essential is, of course, true, but hardly surprising or exceptional. 
And I think one can contrast a rather surprising indifference shown in Italy to the anniversary of 1848 with the uh, great interest which it um, uh, aroused in Germany, and perhaps we could talk a little bit more about that. Uh, and viewing the early history of the Risorgimento from the perspective of 1859 to 60, in general, gives, I think, an unduly Piedmont-centered interpretation of events. It tends to overlook not only 1848, but the fact that in 1814, 1820, and 1848, Movements for Italian independence and for constitutional freedoms started in the south, in Naples or Sicily, and not in the north. I'm sure John will be happy to hear me say this, but the Neapolitan constitutional experiment of 1820 was much longer and more significant than the Piedmontese movement of 1821, which in the orthodox Piedmontese version of history usually receives more attention. Another central aspect of the Risorgimento which we cannot understand if we focus too narrowly on 1859 to 61 uh, and treat it um, as simply a prelude, is that of the relationship uh, between the church and the nation and between Catholicism and liberalism. Now here I'll, I really will try and be very brief because I'm nearing the end of my time. I apologize for not having given more attention to this important topic. Wait a minute, sorry. We got, ah, yes. Um, turn the greens up a bit better. This is a remarkable, because this is a remarkable picture of Pio Nono, Pius IX, uh, in 1847, uh, I presume 1848, I'm not sure which, depends on the month, 1847 to 8, you can see the benevolent expression, which I think you can just see there, right into the, the, the banner on the left says Pio IX, Viva Pio IX, and the banner on the right says Viva la Guardia Civica, long live the civic guard not something which is normally associated with popes and which in his later career Pius IX certainly wanted to have nothing to do with. And of course the, um, the single national cry which united, most united, the rebels of 1848 uh, was Viva Pio Nono. I think personally, I'll skip over very rapidly this and come to my conclusion, I think personally uh, I mean, of course, Pope Pio IX then became the Pope of the syllabus, which de de denounced anything you can think of, liberalism, nationalism, freedom of the press, that nefasta, fatal error, uh, the tolerance of other religions, and so on and so on, and uh, culminated his grandiose theological career with uh, stage, uh, stage managing, he didn't invent theology, but stage managing the proclamation of papal infallibility in 1870, and the imposition of a much harsher and stronger centralized discipline on the Italian church, which was particularly intended to stamp out the embers of uh, liberal Catholicism. Um, Pius IX had no interest in Cavour's liberal formula of a free church in a free state, because he didn't even want a free church. And when Cavour's formula was mentioned to him, he became particularly agitated. Well, now I will really come to my final conclusion. Well, I will just mention to you that if you look at Italy today, you can see that culture wars between church and state, arguments over the limits, the proper limits of the church and the lay state are still uh, very uh, active, still uh, arouse a great deal of heat and less light. Now my final conclusion. First, perhaps the experience of national unification is inseparable from disillusionment in all countries. There is a temptation to contrast the great ideals of the past with the sordid realities of the present. Think, for example, of India in this respect. Yet, while we should admire the heroism and dedication of the men who made unity and liberty possible, we cannot ignore, I think, the profound dissatisfaction precisely of the best and the brightest with the Italy they had helped to create. But that I hope to say more next time when I talk about North and South. Secondly, um, there is an interesting question about relationship with the past, which I have, which derives from reading two recent books by Banti and a uh, 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 friend and English historian Paul Ginsborg, called respectively Sublime Madre Nostra, and a uh, sort of urgent title, Paul Ginsborg's book, more political title, Salviamo l'Italia, Let's Save Italy. And I should stress that the authors cooperated in editing a collective volume on the Risorgimento, which is a, really a compendium of the new cultural approach. However, they seem to me to differ radically in their approach to the uses of the Risorgimento. While Ginsburg wants us to hear the voices of the Risorgimento mingled with our own, Banti insists that the Risorgimento is another country, 
and is sharply critical of the former President Ciampi's revival of, quote, the symbolic universe of Italian nationalism as it was constructed from the Risorgimento through to fascism. Thank you. Yes, it's a, very, it's a very good and very difficult question. Personally, I think there is a difference, as I do think that the official ideology of Italian nationalism, it's full of denunciations of municipalism, denunciation of the fact that uh, Italians have remained so divided because they are attached to their municipality. Uh, Manzoni, I believe, even said that not division, but diversity is one of the worst things that you can say about Italians, which I, is a statement I wouldn't, I wouldn't agree with. Um, so that I think that somehow the reluctance on the official level and the imposition, I mean, the, the symbolic, if you like, centralization of Italy, the fact that, which was, which was much resented rather than regions, uh, the fact that um, these weren't precisely Heimat, but that the capitals of Milan, like Milan and Naples, were officially reduced to status of just uh, ordinary uh, heads of provinces, not uh, regional capitals, the absence of any federal structure, which of course there always was in Germany except under national socialism. I think this does make the reconciliation of Heimat and the nation, a bit, and the nation state, I should say, a bit harder than in Germany. And I think the Italians did not always, some did, but the Italians not always really gr and, uh, grasped the idea that, you know, that, local lo that it isn't a zero-sum game, that in fact uh, local loyalties may uh, very much uh, feed into uh, and reinforce a national loyalty. I don't want to overstate the case. I think what has been shown is an interesting book by a uh, young German historian who teaches in England, Axel Kroner, on Bologna. And I mean, this goes in the line of a lot of other studies. This shows, of course, that centralization didn't actually altogether by any means work. And that after 1860, what happened is that particularly cultural elites in the cities, and even in smaller cities, reinvented themselves. Uh, they reinvented themselves as parts of the Italian nation, but with a strong emphasis on their particular history, their particular contributions. Bologna rediscovered its Etruscan past and so on. It's, uh, it's, uh, there was an invented, I think, invented, well, invented tradition, but an invented date. Carducci, who was not a Bologna, but taught in Bologna, Carducci invented the date of the foundation of Bologna University in order to hold its 900th anniversary. There are all sorts of I mean, local elites are pushed back, to use a phrase, I don't particularly like to use a contemporary phrase, pushed back strongly against centralization. Uh, nevertheless, I think it does remain, I mean, you get on the other side too, you get a lot of denunciations of the central state and interference of these interfering nosy parkers, interfering instruments of the uh, government and the political class, the prefects, um, uh, from uh, representatives of uh, local interests and from serious intellectual representatives. The whole tradition of Catania and in his youth at least, Gaetano Salvemini. Gaetano Salvemini, an example of this. Gaetano Salvemini said the solution to all Italy's problems was really, or the first solution, uh, was to get rid of the prefects. Um, there were a lot of problems with this. I think most historians, and even Salvini himself in a way, have included that particularly in the South, we're talking about that final thing, getting rid of the prefects and leaving all the power in the hands of the local elites would not have been the best solution. Well, Salvemini also believed in universal suffrage. That again showed itself to be less of a solution than perhaps he imagined. But there is a strong tradition now for also saying, well, 
we really, this centralized state is a monster which we have to combat. So I think this reconciliation uh, is harder. Somehow it doesn't seem to have quite, doesn't seem to have worked either, which is more in the contemporary republic. After all, regional government, which was in the constitution, was introduced in fact in 1970. It's been around for 40 years. It seemed to be sort of like the people used to talk about the imperfect uh, bipartisan system, the days when the communists and the Christian Democrats were running the show. Um, but uh, now I think one could also sort of speak of an, uh, of an imperfect federalism or an imperfect regionalism. It seems to have left everybody discontented. Certainly, the great uh, representatives of the Heimat are now the Northern League. The Northern League is all about Heimat, I think. But it rejects the idea of the national state. And on the contrary, the national parties, the other national parties, uh, I think show on the whole a rather deplorable indifference to, they've rather lost their tradition of grassroots campaigning, which was certainly once upon a time characteristic of the Communist Party and also in many areas of the Christian Democrats. This is a big problem because they've left the high mark rather to the, uh, the lead at the moment. I have a um, counterfactual rather than a historiographic question. Okay. And I'm reminded of uh, Ginger Rogers and uh, <laughs> Fred Astaire. Uh, she gave him sex and he gave her clout. <laughs> we have this, and you might say that Cavour and his friends gave respectability to the Italian state but it had this very serious democratic deficiency. And you talked about artisans, but that was urban artisans, and most Italians were not city people. Mm -hmm. And so what might have happened if Murat's dynasty had remained in Naples in 1815, and it, that might have happened, or again, if Garibaldi, instead of waving his flag, had just stayed put, and had there been, in a sense, a, a, an altogether different trajectory mm. for the Risorgimento? Or is that just not? No, I think these are interesting. I mean, I, I'm all for counterfactuals, not particularly good, but I mean, I pose these counterfactual questions. I think start with the last one first. I think I, just, I th personally think that if Garibaldi had stayed put, well, probably there would have been, even, first of all, what is, I think, certainly true is that there would have been uh, even less. I mean, Garibaldi brought back uh, the popular and even revolutionary element even if he finally abandoned it, into the Risorgimento, which was conspicuously absent on the whole in 1859, which was a conventional war where, in fact, uh, you know, and Cavour's attempts to raise various rebellions against uh, the rulers, uh, particularly in, in the papal states, were on the whole a failure. Liberals didn't do, I mean, liberals like Cavour, moderate liberals, didn't do revolution, not surprisingly. They didn't do revolution very well. Uh, it, there was a, a kind of revolution in Tuscany, which was where there was more Democrats and the liberals who organized it. But there, there was a, re a sort of revolutionary movement against the Grand Dukes, it must be said, rapidly sort of co-opted by the liberals. So that was one exception. But I still think uh, that given weakness, I mean, uh, John might disagree, I still think that the odds, once the rest of Italy had been unified, the odds on Naples remaining indefinitely independent uh, were very bad. Sicily was in a state of almost permanent revolt against Naples. I mean, the reason why Garibaldi went to Sicily is because he was, uh, there was a revolution which failed in Palermo, but uh, Sicilian informants and uh, through Crispi told Garibaldi that the, something Dennis Max Smith studied very well, the revolt was still going on in the country. The peasants were in revolt. They were burning tax offices and government offices. There was, there was therefore favorable conditions for the revolutionary expedition couldn't possibly have succeeded without strong support from the Sicilian population. So Sicily uh, would have uh, liked to have assisted. I just don't see really that the Kingdom of Naples would have been strong enough to stand very much on its own. There was its international support, which once upon a time had been very strong. Russia, for example, was a patron of Naples as well as Austria. It also uh, declined. There was very strong English hostility. Gladstone, of course, had called the government the negation of God, and more practically, the British didn't like Naples' protectionist policies. So I think the odds were on a long-term survival, were against the long-term survival of Naples. I think it would have been much lighter, and if, if anything, if Garibaldi hadn't gone, it would have been a more uh, monarchic. There might not, if there had been more preparation and more, if the thing hadn't come so much as a surprise, the Piedmontese administration perhaps might have made a better, and the administration might have made a better job 
and there might be more thought about uh, what you do when you enter a, a country like Naples. Instead, as I would say, sort of the uh, occupation of Naples followed uh, uh, what one might call the Iraq model, uh, ignoring all local conditions, among other things, making the disastrous mistake of dissolving the national army, thereby providing rebels called brigands with a great source of uh, armed men. Um, earlier, interesting, I sort of wondered, I remember meeting a, a once a funny conference with a Bavarian historian who I, I can't remember his name now, but I uh, was told that he spent his spare time writing uh, fantasy po political novels about the survival of independent Bavaria. Um, <laughs> Um, well, it's not an impossible thought. I think an interesting, another interesting question is what would have happened, is it, I don't think it was entirely impossible. For instance, in 1814, well, let's say if, uh, uh, to add another counterfactual, uh, if Napoleon had been victorious at Waterloo, uh, who says that Murat, starting in Naples, might not have unified Italy? What would the consequence of that have been? At that point, it gets very difficult to say. Uh, I think the idea of a, of a nation, it, perhaps because of the social weaknesses, the idea of a nation, any later stage, unified from Naples, even in 1820, when Naples is a kind of leader, is not very credible. But I think one could imagine even, a, say, a, a, a nation which had been united in a federal way. That, of course, is my utopia as a resident in Tuscany, formerly in Bologna. But, I mean, a sort of federal unity in which the Grand Dukes of Tuscany had played the leading role. Because, after all, in 1839, everybody said, these are good people, these organized a congress, national congress of, of scientists, which is a great national event, and they're and sort of exiles from other countries, books and people who can't get their books published in other nations, most of all, by the way, I mean, in Piedmont particularly, uh, used to sort of kind of uh, take refuge in Tuscany, where there was generally more tolerant and easygoing atmosphere. So it could have been a different kind of... But I think one has to come back to the fact with all that I sort of, uh, could be accused of some anti-Piedmontese bias, but it's an attempt to correct what I think has been a bias in another direction. It has to be said that, I mean, Piedmont did have, although its army was not what it was, it did have a serious state with a serious ruling class, nobility committed to uh, the service of the state. And I mean, when Ricasoli, having you know, taken part in a successful movement for reform uh, and the cons towards the Constitution of Reform, a successful movement for reform in Tuscany in 1847, vast pop patriotic demonstrations were a huge success, involving people from other parts of Italy as well. Uh, when he goes to Piedmont, he says, my God, you know, these are... Let's face it, these are the only serious people. These are the only people who are going to do something about, well, not even kicking the Austrians out, but preventing the Austrians coming and kicking us out, but, uh, and that there is a serious state here. So one does always have to take that fine consideration. If I could <clears throat> follow on on that, I think um, Tuscany is a really good mm. example when you bring on the 1859 and, and 60 on the, the, uh, the issue, because there's no question, I think, Thomas Crowell has shown us that, that uh, Rick Astley and, and the Tuscan landowners thought this was their opportunity to establish a sort of uh, an aristocratic um, republic, or at least a, a self-governing uh, state in Tuscany. And of course the problem was that then it immediately became clear to them that if they pursued that line, either uh, Louis Napoleon mm. was going to uh, finish up putting a French prince into Florence, or they'd get the Grand Duke back uh, right. at the invitation of the, uh, of the French. So, in fact, Piedmont was the least worst, but it wasn't exactly. an optional uh, solution. And also, I mean, I think you're right that, that uh, in the South, uh, you know, 1860 is third time lucky for the exactly. Sicilian separatists. Yeah. They tried it uh, in 1820, they tried it in 1848. I mean, they even invited um, they've been shopping all around Europe looking for yeah. uh, for someone to come as the as the ruler, and that was another thing I think that made any internal liberalisation of the border state mm. impossible. Because exactly, it yeah. would have meant no. um, losing Sicily, which they mm. which the Bourbons couldn't couldn't do. But I, the more I mean, it seems to me that the the um, uh, one of the really um, fascinating parts of your uh, uh, your talk is this emphasis on 1848 because, I mean, it's extraordinary when you look at the literature, there are only two books on revolutions of 1848 
yeah. since I think the mm. early 1950s. Right. And they're both written by non Italian historians yeah. Paul Ginsburg on, on Venice mm. uh, and the Roma uh, on Livorno. Very, actually. It's not one I think, I can't remember the name, there is something now, now I think, come out on the, some things have come out on the Roman. On the, yeah, oh, it's sorry, sorry, I beg your pardon. Yeah, you know, on the whole, on the Roman Revolution, for, on the Roman for, uh, Republic. Sorry, it's, it's actually a huge yeah. gap, which, and until it starts being filled, it's, it's, it's rather right. difficult to reconfigure. But yeah, I think that you, you, you've made some very interesting suggestions about what direction it could take you in. But I do wonder, too, if we look at 1848-9 in the context of uh, the rediscovery of, of Italian cultural nationalism and, and, and symbolism, 1848-49 gives us clear evidence of the strength of nationalist feeling, but equally clear evidence that the strength of, of nationalist concepts didn't lead to any kind of unity. Uh, and that, it seems to me, to be one mm. of the lacuna of um, Dante's real yeah. proposition of, of, of cultural nationalism. And it also continues that earlier underestimation of the force of local mm. uh, identity. If you, if you look at 1848, all of the revolutions collapsed internally. Genoa mm. against Turin, Venice against the uh, cities of the Terra Firma, mm. Rome against the cities of, of the, uh, the Papal oh, States. Oh, you know, the Bible, yeah. yeah. Uh, and you know, Civita Vecchia and, and uh, uh, Bologna, Ferrara. Naples against Sicily, Naples against the provinces, Palermo against Messina. Now, uh, I mean, that's why the the, the Croce um, wanted to move on quickly because yeah. this was all going in the wrong direction. But I mean, wasn't this really what, in the end, um, created the um, uh, the single Italian state? Because the only escape route mm. for all these local autonomous pretensions was that centralised state which yeah. was created? I, well, I think there's a lot of, obviously, a lot of truth in this, and that, that part of the, 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 the traditional or sort of view is certainly correct. I, mean, I think, first of all, that, first of all, I think federalism was clearly, uh, at least in the Italian context, um, a very bad way of um, actually, it just wasn't efficient or quick enough. I mean, anyway, it's confederalism. Of course, the old uh, kings were still in power. I mean, there wasn't a new united federal constitution. It was a confederation. It's a very bad way of achieving uh, uh, unity, or rather of achieving independence uh, in the face of Austria, which, I mean, it didn't seem obvious at once because, of course, as we know, the Austrian Empire appeared to be uh, in collapse. In fact, the revolution in Vienna had broken out before the revolution in Milan. Um, uh, as late as October, it looks as if it might be collapsing. Unfortunately for the Italians, of course, the one thing that held together very well uh, was the Austrian army, and that was quite enough, thanks. Um, but, um, I mean, the Piedmontese were no match for that either. Um, I would a little bit less emphasize the, um, the internal division thing. I mean, I think what was crucial, uh, and in a way worked for a while, worked very well in 1847, worked very well until it came to take, I think until it came to taking on the Austrians, the idea that we can be uh, local uh, and national at the same time, or indeed that we need and believe in two nations because the Sicilians certainly believed, I mean, Sicilians certainly believed that Sicily was a nation, but that didn't necessarily mean that it couldn't be part of Italy for a federal way. Um, it's getting to north and south. There's a lovely story about this that the sort of liberal leaders, I mean, the national, le national leaders of the revolution, the, the, the educated, whatever, leads of the revolution, going through the streets of Palermo, I think, while the revolution is still going on, whenever they meet a group of workers or a group of people, uh, uh, they shout, Viva Pionono, and the, uh, the Palermitani reply, Viva Santa Rosalia. <laughs> or is it Rosalia? I never remember. Rosalia, I think. Rosalia, Santa Rosalia, who was the local Palermo saint. Um, Venice and the Terra Firma, it's quite true, their, their traditional uh, enmity revived. I mean, all the same, uh, the Veneto had to be reconquered by the Austrians after quite a sort of tough... Uh, campaign. The Roman Republic, I think the latest evidence shows that if certainly the peasants didn't rise in favor of uh, Mazzini's Roman Republic, what was by then Mazzini's Roman Republic, rather to people's surprise, they didn't rise against it either. And I don't think Rome did fall from within. It was, it was, it was conquered. 
And I mean, uh, Bologna, I must as a Bolognese patriot, remember the 8th of August, 1848, when the Bolognese repelled the first Austrian attempt to recapture Bologna. So, uh, but I think it, uh, clearly, I mean, that as a way of getting rid of the Austrians, it proved, and uh, one of the crucial weaknesses, of course, is that is the rivalry between monarchs. I mean, uh, it, uh, the other kings can't altogether be blamed for, or at all, for believing that Charles Albert was acting in his and Piedmont's exclusive interest, dragged his feet whenever you know, the question of the customs league, for example, between one of the first uh, unitary initiatives. Um, and of course, uh, both uh, King Ferdinand of Naples and the Pope withdrew their support, well, really, uh, fairly early. Reasons why the Pope there are complicated as Ferdinand, I think, well, the Democrats. So, I mean, it wasn't a good way. I think there must be, I would also say that, I mean, the arguments against federalism as a way of achieving unity don't necessarily prove that federalism of some kind would have been impracticable after 1860, because, I mean, you know, that's a, a quite different, quite different game. Well, I mean, surely, surely, I mean, the turn towards um, uh, Piedmont and the turn towards uh, people saying, what, well, when it comes down to it, what we need are, uh, you know, uh, muskets and cannon, and the only people who have those are the Piedmontese. Um, it's no question, the move towards a, a stronger form of national unity, um, which Raymond Grew wrote about very well in his book on the National Society, which was actually founded partly by ex-Democrats. I'm afraid nobody can doubt that that was uh, um, the failures. But let's not forget that, that in fact, in 1848-9, it was the monarchic effort which failed first. Uh, the republics uh, held out for longest, the republics of Rome and Venice. Well, thank you, Adrian. Uh, precise, theorized, learned, interesting, very nice. <laughs> so uh, I invite you now to go upstairs where there's a, going to be a uh, reception. Thank you again, Adrian. <laughs>